Thank you, Antares. Yeah, thank you, you so very coming. much. Thanks for familiar faces. I see Prof uh, Yoshida there. Mm. Good morning. And it was nice to listen to the Japanese uh, being spoken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much more fluent, aren't I? <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, supporting us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so very much. Um, I must really thank Igba also for always um, calling upon me to join them, sometimes to participate. So good morning to all of you. Um, let me start formally by extending special greetings to the director of the UNESCO Igba and the Igba and the UNESCO team. Should I start or should I wait for the MC? Because something no, I, I, I think, yeah, we, we, we are going to, we're going to do that. I'll give you the floor later. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, it just occurred to me that, you know, there yeah, yeah, is yeah. really- We, we yeah, wanted okay. to make sure that you are with us. Oh, no, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us uh, and uh, okay. as usual. So. Okay. 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 Good morning, good afternoon to all. Before we start, uh, I would like to remind some housekeeping roles. Uh, because we have some French speaking participants, uh, we request them kindly to click on the translation icon. It is the first uh, icon on your right of the on the right of your computer, and then you can select the French language. All participants are invited to post their questions and comments in the chat box. Our colleagues, uh, Bernard and Jose, we share them with the, with the panelists during the question and answer session. Also, the panelists can uh, uh, directly answer to the, to the questions. So these were some, some, some requisites, some rules I would like to remind. Dear participants, honorable guests, good morning, good afternoon, bonjour, bonsoir, konnichiwa, depending on where you are and the language you're speaking. We are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is the third of a series of four sessions. Before developing on the objectives of the present webinar, I would like to use the occasion to appreciate uh, the government of Japan for their continued support to UNESCO IGBA for youth empowerment on peace and resilience building and prevention of violent extremism. This project as has been reminded uh, earlier, is an essential project that helps build the capacity of teacher educators in prevention of violent extremism through teacher development. Special thanks to uh, uh, Hiroshima University and Nagasaki University, who has continued to partner with us for the last four years. So your immense support to this project is really deeply appreciated. We would also like to Thank my uh, UNESCO IGBA colleagues, Nagasaki University colleagues, and Hiroshima University colleagues who have worked tirelessly in the organization of this session. The general objectives of the series of webinars are as follows. Very quickly, is to develop evidence-based generic training materials for peace building, resilience, prevention of violent extremism through teacher education. A second objective, is to support at least 25 countries build the capacity of future educators through the integration and institutionalization of peace education into current tertiary education and teacher curricula and programs. A third objective is to document good practices and facilitate experience sharing for all countries in Africa on the integration of peace education that advocates for resilience building and prevention of violent extremism through the voices of teachers and youth in Africa. Fourth objective is to share experience with Japan. Usually that experience sharing is done through a study tour in Japan, but this year due to COVID-19 pandemic, the study tour was canceled and replaced by this series of webinars. For the last three years, the study tour to Japan occurred and 60 high education and TTI representative and policymakers visited uh, the country, the, visited Japan and some institutions there. And last but not least, 
An objective is to create a forum for Japanese higher education, higher educators and African educators to discuss and share lessons learned and challenges in the education system, both in Japan and Africa. For this session, we'll discuss the following topic. A world without nuclear weapons, challenges of Nagasaki University by the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition, RETNA, at Nagasaki University and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITA. We'll talk about that in respect of the following agenda. First of all, uh, my name is uh, Salu Sal. I'm the, the Senior Program Coordinator of, at UNESCO IGBA, and I'll have the honor to, to moderate. The honor. As a uh, welcome remarks, we'll be listening to Ms. Antares Ndongjata, Director and Representative uh, of UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya, who has always supported UNESCO IGBA. Uh, I remind uh, colleagues and participants that Ms. Antares Ndongjata uh, traveled with us during the study tour we had last year, it was in 2019, and together we visited uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima with the different universities and institutions. So special thanks to Antares Longjata. After that, welcome remarks. We'll uh, give the floor to Professor Satoshi uh, Hiroshi of Nagasaki University, who will be talking to us about a world without net nuclear weapons, challenges of Nagasaki University. This remark will be followed, this presentation will be followed by another presentation on a world without nuclear weapons. And that presentation will be made by director Mieko Kumamoto of the United Nations Institute and Training for Training and Research. After those presentations, we'll uh, go to the discussions, question and answer sessions, which will be moderated by our colleagues from UNESCO IGBA, Bernard and Jose. And during that sessions, uh, our colleagues will uh, forward questions to the panelists who are also free to look at the chat room and answer directly to the questions. And last but not least, we will finish this session by uh, closing remarks, which will be made by Dr. Yumiko Yokozeki, director of UNESCO IGBA. Hoping that the session will uh, uh, be very, very fruitful and the discussion will be very interactive. I'm going to give the floor to Director Antares Ndongjata uh, from the UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa. So Director, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, uh, Salyu, and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, you could see how eager I was to get started. And like you have mentioned, it brings back fresh memories of that very important um, uh, tour, uh, which was very educative and through which we learned a lot. Let me start by extending greetings to the director of the UNESCO IGBA, uh, Dr. Yumiko Yokozeki. Um, the representatives, the professors from the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, um, from Nagasaki uh, University, and um, the professor uh, from the Hiroshima and colleagues, uh, representatives from African countries, from the Ministry of Education, Higher Education, Teacher Training Institutions, um, dear colleagues from uh, UNESCO offices um, and IGBA. It's indeed a, a pleasure to, to add my voice in uh, wel welcoming all of you to have participated this session and webinar, um, whose focus is really, really critical and important in, in what we do, um, that is a world without nuclear weapons, which is part of UNESCO's IGBA's webinar series on peace education and resilience building. Um, focusing on Japan's educational policies and training programs. Really, um, let me also join my vo add my voice in, in appreciating 
and extending gratitude to the Japanese Embassy of Ethiopia, the government of Japan, Hiroshima University Center for the Study of International Cooperation, and today's presenters from Nagasaki University and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Uh, today's webinar is, is really, really, like I said, um, important in focusing on a more peaceful world without weapons. Uh, however, we must first understand the nature of peace and analyze the way we talk about uh, and think about peace. Uh, I believe um, just joining, uh, following from the last webinar where uh, the, the, the question was again raised is um, in my view, how are we really addressing peace? Uh, because we've been um, in this business of peace building, uh, sustainable peace, right from the, the, the start of um, the setup of uh, the UN. Um, what are the conditions that would be important uh, for us uh, to realize peace? And quite naturally, it speaks about enabling children and people to thrive and to self-actualize, uh, uh, encouraging and ensuring that people live in, in peace and happiness uh, through government's uh, policies that would ensure inclusive quality education, um, justice in all its ramification, be it economic, uh, social, uh, political, um, to, all towards um, ensuring that we have social harmony. Um, we, we know um, the triggers uh, of uh, conflicts and, 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 and wars, uh, essentially uh, deprivation, uh, inequality, um, violence, etc. We cannot really speak peace, uh, no matter how much um, we engage in trying to teach peace. Uh, we really need to ensure that um, we begin to look at uh, a, a different approach. We must really um, understand that, yes, education is very powerful. And in this instance, teachers um, would be um, great um, uh, promoters of peace through their, their, course, uh, their courses, um, through the environment they create in the school. But we know that the children uh, and the different um, uh, persons we interact with have other spaces. And so probably as we talk about education for peace, we need to really begin to look at uh, multiple pathways through which the education can take place, be it in the formal, the non-formal and in the informal. Uh, because when, when we teach peace, we need to look at the root causes and the drivers of conflict, which are not necessarily um, something that you would experience within the, the, the school environment. So uh, much as we want to build the minds to think about it, we know that in Africa in particular, as opposed to Japan, we're still struggling with a huge number of out of school children, adults and illiterate population. And so therefore, um, as we talk about uh, the, the policies, the policies must really be um, uh, broad enough uh, to be able to look at education in and outside of school and, and teachers therefore would then be equipped with um, uh, the necessary transformative pedagogies um, to, for peace to be realized. And thank God we are in, in, a, in, a, in a situation presently where we, we, we can leverage technology and we can look at all forms of technology, not just through the transmission of the, the, the courses uh, in within the, the, the spheres of the classroom, but use uh, radio, um, use uh, mobile phones. And uh, of course, like we're doing right now, mobilize um, through webinars of this nature where teachers would begin to interact with not just the students within the four walls of their classrooms, but with other actors that also need to benefit from this nourishment of their minds in order to think differently. And as we talk about uh, um, uh, the, the focus on uh, 
the fact that we're looking at a world without nuclear, we, we really have to then target our science students because as science can be um, something positive and also something negative. So that even as we look at nuclear, it's for a, a positive um, a contribution to development and not a destructive uh, uh, contribution. Uh, peace, uh, we know, uh, has always been situated as um, the backbone of uh, uh, the raison d'etre for UNESCO. And um, we always talk about building peace in the minds of men and women. We also have seen that um, apart from it being a priority within UNESCO, which cuts across everything we do in UNESCO, education, culture, science, communication, is all towards building this sustainable peace. Um, here in Africa as well, we know that the aspiration of Agenda 2063 emphasizes that a culture of peace and tolerance shall be nurtured in Africa's children and youth through peace education. Um, uh, and we know that this year is supposed to be the year for the silencing of the gun. By 2020, we are in 2020, but we can see how many um, disruptions are going on as a result of lack of peace in Africa. And even where um, Igba is headquartered right now, there is so much unease because of um, crises that mean uh, easily uh, um, lead on to uh, reg uh, regional um, uh, conflict or even war. And so therefore, given all what we are doing, um, we know that this year for silencing the guns um, would not really uh, materialize, which has been further compounded by other challenges and crises, uh, principally that of COVID-19, for instance. Um, we also know that even as we speak today, we have unrest in Nigeria in the north, where we, we've, in, on the 28th, there was an attack uh, on farmers. We have uh, uh, challenges in Congo. We have it in the Sahel. So when would these guns be silent? Is it only through the, the formal education or we must have to begin to look at um, education in its broader context? And this really, therefore, gives um, the principal role of higher education institutions to inform policies based on the research on how to tackle the issues of peace, which for now seems to be uh, very evasive, elusive. Uh, we know Japan has done very well, and this is the reason why it's very central in what we do, that this collaboration with Japan would help us um, to really begin to recalibrate the way we, we discuss uh, peace education in our schools, in our universities, but in other spaces as well. I hope this webinar will provide an opportunity uh, for African higher education institutions, um, ministries of education to share and get new perspectives on the area of peace education and training um, that is so very much needed in Africa. But let me just close by saying, as we tackle uh, um, peace education, let's also realize that we need to engage in a more integrated manner and work outside spaces of school we're very well using teachers and higher education institutions to inform to educate to train um, finally I, I would like to thank again all those who have really made this webinar possible I thank the government um, for the uh, government of Japan for the financial support for this good cause, uh, the Hiroshima University for coordinating all the events, um, all the, the the participants present. But really, let me applaud the excellent work that Igba is doing because it's keeping it alive. Uh, that tour helped us, and it was not only targeting. Uh, um, uh, uh, university lecturers, but it also brought in uh, an angle of um, the civil society and the private sector. I hope that um, this webinar would really meet um, the expectation of participants and together we will work uh, for sustainable peace. Thank you very much. Um, and over to you, Sally. Thank you very much, Director and Therese for this uh, brilliant uh, intervention as usual, and for the advice and advocacy you gave on equipping teachers with all necessary tools and research resources to leave no one behind. And also for your appeal 
to for higher education and all teachers to have new perspectives so that peace is built um, sustainably in Africa and throughout the world. So thank you very much, uh, Director. Uh, I would also at this stage uh, like to uh, give special thanks to Professor Kazuhiro Yoshida, Director of the Center for Study of International Cooperation in Education Science of Hiroshima University. And I think the next step would consist in having a group picture, Jerusalem. Yes, we have a group picture and Marianne is ready to check yes, uh, before, to take our before picture. proceeding. Yes, yes. So Marianne, yes. over to you. Hello, greetings to everyone. Could you please turn on your video so we can take a group picture? We have about half the participants still with their videos off. Please turn on your cameras just for a moment so we can take a group photo. Oh. Okay, last call to turn your cameras on. Let's take the picture on the count of three. One, two, three. One more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. <laughs> and now we can proceed uh, uh, with the uh, agenda. I'm going to give the floor to Professor Satoshi Hiroshi, who will be making, uh, I mean, she's from uh, Nagasaki University and will be making us a presentation. on the world without nuclear weapons challenges thank you very much my name is satoshi hirose professor and vice director of research center for nuclear weapons operation of nagasaki university and it is my great pleasure to have an opportunity to share some of our experiences with you, all of you. Okay, I'd like to start. Well, as you know, Nagasaki City has a tragic experience of atomic bombing. And also Nagasaki University was once devastated by atomic bombing in August 9th, 1945. The second atomic bomb was exploded just over our campus, just over the campus of medical school and it killed most students as well as faculty staffs of our medical school as well as killed more than 70,000 ordinary citizens in Nagasaki City and practically Nagasaki City was devastated by three effects of atomic bomb. The blast, blast blew up practically everything within several hundred meters around the explosion. And also, the nuclear explosion released the national heat around the explosion. And I showed this picture of melted bottles. But even 
tones merited just below the explosion. And I think you can imagine the magnitude of high temperature of the heat produced by nuclear explosion. And the third effect was radiation. You cannot see, you cannot sense, you cannot hear radiation produced by nuclear explosion, but certainly radiation inflicted fearful effect on human bodies. And those who are very close to the explosion were instantly killed by radi either radiation or heat or blast. But even those who survived blast and heat, gradually, many of them gradually died from the diseases caused by radiation, like cancer, leukemia, or chromosome abnormality. And uh, real serious problem is that radiation damaged gene of human body, human cell, means that the effects of radiation might be heredited by the second generation or the third generations of the survivors of atomic bombing. Well, in a sense, fortunately enough, we do not have any statistical evidence or hard cases of serious diseases caused by this kind of hereditary problems among the second generations and third generations. But second generations and third, well, mainly for the second generations of the survivors of atomic bombing, they are requested to undergo periodical medical checks so that any symptom might be caused by radiation would be detected at the early stage. But until now, there is no clear evidence that these second generations and third generations are more fragile for cancer or leukemia. So our medical doctors say that still they cannot deny the possibility, but at least up to now, they cannot find any serious problem among, serious health problem among the second generations and some generations of the survivors. But it is also true that they are very much concerned. And uh, always many second generations and third generations people of survivors are expressing their fears about the possible cancer or leukemia. And this is a destroyed building of Nanosaki Medical College just situated just below the explosion. And practically the campus was totally devastated. And this is the currently, the place currently used as a main campus of Nagasaki University where our research center is located. During the war, that place was used by Mitsubishi heavy industry to produce arms and weapons. And that was one of the reasons why the United States dropped 
atomic bomb over Nagasaki City because Nagasaki City was well known for its heavy industries producing arms and weapons. And this is the uh, numbers of casualties among staff and students of Nagasaki University caused by atomic bombing. At that time, a medical college had about 1,000 students and faculties, means that almost 90% of medical college students and staff faculties were killed. Teachers' courage and courage of economics, their campus uh, were a little bit far from the place of explosion, and not too many students were killed. And still, we can find some monuments, remnants, and leftovers of atomic bombing with some explanations. And we do know how inhumane and disastrous once a nuclear weapon would be used. But still, there are more than thirteen thousand nuclear warheads ready to be used in the world. And Nagasaki University, when Well, once there was a plan to simply abolish Nagasaki University because it was heavily damaged and many people believed it would be much better to abolish the old Nagasaki University and establish a new university somewhere else. But the survivors of Nagasaki University made tremendous and miraculous efforts to reconstruct the campus and rebuild the university. And finally, Japanese government agreed to reconstruct Nagasaki University and Practically, a new university was established in Nagasaki. And now we have nine, eight, nine undergraduate schools and seven graduate schools, I guess. And we have around 8,000 students in our campuses. And Based on this history, Nagasaki University have, has made a lot of efforts toward nuclear disarmament and ultimate abolition of nuclear weapons. And particularly, Dr. Tsuchiyama, who was a former president of Nagasaki University and medical professor. And he himself was a survivor of atomic bombing. Stressed two points. One is that we have to disseminate the reality of atomic bombing to inform all the people about the atrocity of nuclear weapons. 
and it would motivate many people to promote nuclear disarmament. And it would persuade other people of the necessity to abolish nuclear weapons. And we have to appeal to the sensitivity of the people. And at the same time, we have to provide logical way to abolish nuclear weapons. We have to deny the value of nuclear weapons. We have to persuade other people to accept the logic that we can live without nuclear weapons. And we have to present persuasive and realistic way of disarmament. And we have to persuade people by logic and reason. Based on his proposal, Nagasaki University is now implementing two major projects concerning nuclear disarmament. One has a rather long tradition, the establishment of Atomic Bomb Disease Institute, providing medical research and treatments for survivors of atomic bomb. The other is the establishment of Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition. We call it RECNA as an abbreviation. It was established only in 2012. So this is its ninth year. And Atomic Bomb Disease Institute is conducting researches on the survivors health conditions and treatment of survivors of atomic bombs. And they have been reporting so many cases of those who injured by atomic bomb and expressed the reality of damage caused by atomic bomb. And they provide so many evidences to appeal to sensitivity of the people. On the other hand, our research institute is providing policy options based on the analysis of current situation concerning nuclear weapons. And we are trying to persuade the people by using logics and reasons. And we would like to present the possibility of nuclear disarmament. We would like to tell the people that nuclear disarmament is possible and realistic. Well, our institute is not so big, not so big. We only have four full-time researchers and several visiting and part-time researchers. But still, our research center is the only academic research center in the world which is specialized in nuclear disarmament. And we have three major works. One is conducting research and analysis on nuclear disarmament. The second is providing education and training on nuclear disarmament. And the third is implementing outreach programs beyond our campus and classrooms. Well, of course, our institute is a research center and our major task is conducting 
research on nuclear disarmament and produce effective theory for nuclear disarmament. And now many states, including Japan, are insisting that the realistic nuclear disarmament must be based on necessity and possibility. Possibility means considering national security because nuclear weapon is very much important. Many states insist that nuclear weapons are indispensable for their national security, including Japan, because Japan is heavily depending on the so-called nuclear umbrella provided by the United States. But at the same time, we have to pay due attention to humanitarian consideration because we already know that nuclear weapons are inhumane and using nuclear weapons would produce the large scale disaster on human beings. So now we are trying to prove that nuclear weapons are not indispensable or are not reliable or not necessary for our national security. And we have to put more emphasis on humanitarian aspects of nuclear weapons. Well, traditionally, all states, almost all states are maintaining military power to protect country, protect their own countries from possible attacks. Means that all states are possessing their military forces under the name of self-defense. But it is also true that all states do not want to engage in real war because it will cost a lot and it will certainly damage a lot. Even if you are a winner, you will lose a lot of wealth and lives to win the battles and wars. So now many people, many states are expressing or adopting the policy of so-called deterrence to deter possible attacks by demonstrating their military capabilities. And now many states, including Japan, believe that since nuclear weapons are so powerful, deterrence based on nuclear weapons must be really powerful. But we do have some doubt about that basic logic. Because fundamental, there is a fundamental contradiction in deterrent theory. Why you have to deter others? Because you do not trust your neighbors. Because you suspect that your neighbors might attack you at any time. But at the same time, deterrence requires others to calculate and evaluate the cost and benefit of military attack logically. Means that you must trust your neighbors that they do have reasons and rationality to calculate cost and benefit of military attack. So in short, adapting deterrence, deterrence means that you trust your neighbors, at the same time, you do not trust your neighbors. There is a logical contradiction in deterrent theory. And also we are conducting research on the possible establishment of Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Well, in Africa, you already have a nuclear weapon free zone based by Perindaba Treaty, we have to run from you about nuclear weapon free zone. 
And we have been conducting many workshops, international conferences, and publications. This is a picture of the third panel of peace and security of Northeast Asia held in Moscow in 2018. And in the middle, there are representatives from Republic of Korea and Democratic People's Republic of Korea. I mean, both South and North Koreans are participating and they exchanged views. It was possible because it was organized as an academic meeting by universities, not between governments. And we are publishing a journal called Journal for Peace and Nuclear Disarmament, the only academic journal specialized in nuclear disarmament. And we are providing education and training. Of course, we are offering classes on nuclear disarmament, both in undergraduate level and graduate school. And also we are providing trainings for so-called Nagasaki Youth Derogation, a program to educate Nagasaki youth younger generations for nuclear disarmament peace. And we are sending some students every year from Nagasaki to the world. And also we are providing assistance to local elementary and high schools for conducting peace education. Nowadays, we are providing assistance to nationwide. Many schools are now visiting Nagasaki and they dropped by our research center or on web-based lectures. I just provided one web-based lectures for high school students in Tokyo. Now, this is a picture of Nagasaki Youth Delegation when uh, Ambassador Hasrin visited us last year. He was the uh, chairperson of the third preparatory meeting for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Review Treaty. And he is a well-known famous diplomat, and he was willing to have a chance to exchange views with young students from Nagasaki. And also we are implementing outreach programs towards citizens. We are convening open seminars, lectures, and symposiums for ordinary citizens, and we are providing web-based user-friendly database on nuclear issues because many materials and documentations regarding nuclear weapons are written in English and someone must translate them into Japanese so that ordinary citizens may read them. And also we are publishing newsletters, reports, and some papers for ordinary citizens. This is a scene from Open Seminar for Citizens. Oh, may, you may see at the left end, I was answering a question raised by a citizen standing middle. And through these activities and programs, We hope that someday we can persuade everyone that nuclear weapons are not necessary evils, but just absolute evil and must be abolished. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for my presentation. Thank you so very much, Professor. Satoshi Hiroshi from Nagasaki University. Thank you for the information. I would say the third information you shared with us about the bomb, the atomic bombing of Nagasaki University, it's atroc and it's atrocity. It's really very moving. 
but I salute the resilience of Japanese people, thanks to which reconstruction was made possible. Thank you also for sharing the information or the strategy on a campaign for abolishing nuclear weapon. And I really salute the role of Regna in that, the tremendous role of Regna in that campaign, okay, through the various program you were providing. So thank you very much. Now I'm going to give the floor to Director Mieko Kumamoto of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITA, who would be uh, uh, talking to us about a world without nuclear weapons. So Director Mieko Kumamoto, if you are with us, uh, I'm kindly giving you the floor. Great, uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you. Okay, great, great. Well, firstly, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, good morning um, to everyone and also bonjour and uh, konnichiwa, uh, konbanwa. Uh, greetings from Japan. My name is Mihoko Kumamoto. I am a director for UNITA's Hiroshima office and also division for prosperity. Um, Firstly, I would like to express sincere appreciation to uh, UNESCO ICUBA, International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, and also Hiroshima University for inviting me this, to this, um, this important webinar. I would also like to echo uh, with Director Ann Teresa uh, and uh, express sincere appreciation to the government of Japan for financially supporting this important initiative. And it's also wonderful to see uh, familiar faces, Professor uh, Yoshida uh, and also Director Yoko Zeki. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, your faces. Um, so uh, thank you so, so much. So. Uh, Today, um, I am going to talk about how Hiroshima, well, I'll focus on Hiroshima, of course. Um, I am based in Hiroshima, Japan. Uh, I came to Hiroshima six years ago and learned a lot about Hiroshima, not everything, um, but a lot about Hiroshima. So uh, today's uh, presentation focuses on how Hiroshima uh, recovered from uh, destruction. So uh, uh, it's gonna cover what, how Hiroshima was before World War II or during World War II, World War time and what experience Hiroshima went through and then how Hiroshima recovered from ashes to the current modern city. So uh, with that, um, I would like to start sharing my presentation um, and here, uh, so <laughs> I hope you are seeing my slides uh, next to me. So I'm gonna do like this, yes, uh, but before, okay, great, great. Um, but uh, actually before uh, I uh, go through my presentation, I wanna uh, explain quickly about uh, UNITA, United Nations uh, Institute for Training and Research. So um, uh, we are uh, UN's training arm for, um, uh, well, um, sorry, uh, training arm of the United Nations. Um, the headquarters are in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, apart from Switzerland, uh, we have two other offices, one in New York and one in Hiroshima. Why do we have an office in Hiroshima? Um, the reason is because Hiroshima is, is a center of peace uh, and UNITA had this vision to have uh, an office in Hiroshima so that we can disseminate messages of peace from Hi Hiroshima to the world. And this really resonates with what Professor Hiro Hirose said, Professor Hiro Hirose said, peace message from Nagasaki to the world. Uh, so uh, the idea is the same. So a uh, message of peace, uh, I would say from Japan, uh, from both cities, Nagasaki and Hiroshima to the world. Now um, we train, you need to train adults in developing countries, uh, but we focus on the people who have been marginalized. Uh, so uh, for example, we train women, youth, um, 
and also um, people with disability and many other challenges um, so that they can become self-dependent and uh, live in dignity. We focus on six thematic areas, um, our um, Hiroshima Office and Division for Prosperity. Number one is peace and Hiroshima. So uh, here we have been implementing uh, a training on nuclear disarmament and non preparation And you know, Professor Hiroshima, uh, Hirose, very, very uh, interesting to hear uh, what your university has been doing. So uh, very much like to exchange uh, information later on. Um, UNITA's training on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation focuses, uh, we, we focus on uh, diplomats uh, and also uh, officials from the Ministry of Defense. We bring people, uh, these um, people from mostly Asian countries. Um, without COVID, uh, we bring people to Hiroshima so that people can see firsthand um, Hiroshima, however, with COVID, we shifted to online training 100%. Um, so, uh, uh, and we also do youth ambassador training program uh, on peace uh, and also other important topics under sustainable development goals. We also do public sessions, lecture for children uh, and also adults as well. So, uh, uh, so that's that's number one. We also do private uh, training on private sector development, entrepreneurship. Um, many in Africa, uh, many of the participants come from African countries. Uh, so, uh, you know, today I'm very very excited to talk with uh, with you, and I believe many of you are based in Africa. Uh, we also do training on trade and finance. Um, leadership, gender equality empowerment, uh, women's empowerment, anti-corruption, um, and uh, combating financial crimes, uh, also digital technologies nowadays. Um, now, everything uh, is about technologies, um, and also, you know, what we are doing now, Zoom, using, <laughs> you know, digital technology, internet, and this will continue to accelerate even during post-COVID time. So uh, we are uh, implementing training on reskilling, upskilling of um, people in developing countries. Um, so uh, that's what we do. Um, so with that, uh, today, um, I am going to talk about Hiroshima's path to reconstruction. And the content came from a um, study conducted by Hiroshima Prefecture and Hiroshima City. So I am going to present that. And today we have also people from Hiroshima, uh, particularly Professor Yoshida. Uh, so I, I'm really counting on him so that he could also come in and you know, uh, add uh, any uh, additional information to complement. So uh, with that, let me start. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to cover these four areas uh, quickly uh, because I really want to have time to answer any questions you may have. So number one, Hiroshima before war, what it, what, what it, uh, what uh, the city was doing, what kind of functions the city was do doing. And number two, Hiroshima city's damages from atomic bombing. It's uh, similar to what Professor Hirose presented on damages um, caused in, in Nagasaki. I'm gonna talk about what damages Hiroshima experienced. And number three, post-war reconstruction plan uh, and this, uh, I saw uh, one question uh, posted and asking about uh, Americans' uh, intervention in post-conflict recovery. Here, I'm going to talk more about the local people, like what local people did to promote or accelerate uh, conflict recovery. And the number four, uh, what challenges local people faced uh, in uh, reconstruction. Um, so, here, okay, so um, Hiroshima before atomic bombing, Hiroshima 
used to be a center of military operations. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's quite interesting because uh, Professor Hirose also mentioned that Nagasaki University was uh, uh, producing bombs. Uh, so it was uh, in a way um, place for military operations. Hiroshima was also the same. Hiroshima was a center of military operations. Like for example, here, uh, Imperial Army's headquarter, fifth division, was located in Hiroshima uh, back in 1871, around that time. And also Hiroshima had um, extensive transportation network, including port, uh, also railway, streetcar. So a very busy, very vibrant uh, city. So many, uh, you know, movements, people movements, movement of items. So very, very vibrant, active place. And also Hiroshima uh, was, uh, had very um, vibrant, uh, active, heavy and chemical industries. So it was also an economic center. It was also considered a center of learning. Uh, there were many educational institutions based in Hiroshima and uh, Hiroshima had uh, this school, Hiroshima Normal School, which was considered uh, number one in the western part of Hiroshima. So Hiroshima used to be military operation, um, military op in terms of military operations and also economic activities and also uh, education um, and also infrastructure. It was, it was a very active um, city, very vibrant uh, in playing an instrumental role. So that's what Hiroshima was. It was military capital. And then um, what happened during World War II, um, everyone knows the history. So uh, uh, in 1945, August 6, uh, atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And uh, this is a, a summary of uh, damage uh, in Hiroshima. Um, I really would like uh, you, after COVID, uh, to consider uh, to visit Hiroshima and see firsthand, because here I'm, I'm, I'm presenting uh, the facts. However, you know, uh, it really, you know, when you come to Hiroshima, they actually visit the museum and see exhibitions and also talk with survivors. You really, you really understand what, how it was, like what it was like. Uh, that time. Um, here, 96% uh, buildings destroyed. During that time in Hiroshima City, uh, it was believed that uh, there were about 77,000 buildings uh, in Hiroshima. So many, so many buildings. But uh, most of them were completely uh, destroyed uh, because of blast, temperature, uh, Professor Hiroshi mentioned you know, this, uh, you know, this energy atomic bombing uh, releases when it's uh, uh, when it hit the the ground or hit the air. It was it's dropped. And then, in terms of casualty, uh, forty percent of Hiroshima city residents died on the very day. Um, and uh, and also estimate says by the end of nineteen forty five. Approximately 140,000 people uh, died uh, directly related to atomic bombing. Also, in terms of infrastructure, uh, so here it says uh, electricity, water, gas, communications, etc. So uh, uh, infrastructure was heavily, heavily damaged. So this is what Hiroshima looked like immediately after atomic bombing. So uh, you see it basically uh, flat, uh, all the burnt down. And here, some infrastructure, some buildings remained, um, buildings that had really strong uh, structure, uh, one of which is the atomic bomb dome. Um, and by the way, uh, UNITA's office, Hiroshima office, is standing really close to atomic bomb, uh, atomic uh, bomb dome. And it looked like this. 
So basically burned into ashes. So that's what it happened. Now here, I'm gonna talk about uh, recovery, uh, reconstruction. So um, um, we can say, uh, like in, in timeline, uh, there are two, uh, two aspects. Number one is short-term reconstruction and second is more mid-term and long-term reconstruction. Um, so short-term reconstruction, funeral of victims, removal of debris, and crumbling buildings, restoring water supply and sewage infrastructure, uh, restoration of traffic network, electricity, gas, telephone, construction of temporary housing. So, um, but you know, um, when you actually think or uh, look at what actually happened, this was really, really hard process. Uh, for example, so many people, so many people died uh, in a very difficult way. So it's very difficult. Uh, and also body damage was enormous. So often it was impossible to identify whose body is who. And also so many bodies. So um, in many cases, people had to just go with mass uh, cremation. Uh, in Japan, people generally cremate, burn bodies. Um, so a mass, mass cremation. Um, so it was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and also debris uh, and uh, taking care of those, uh, you know, uh, destruction. It was a significant, significant task. Uh, restructuring, uh, recovery of infrastructure systems. Uh, it is said that uh, some systems uh, were recovered relatively quickly, uh, like for example, water supply, electricity, uh, and railway, uh, and streetcar. There is this very, very famous story in Hiroshima. Uh, Hiroshima streetcars, they are small uh, and they run on street and it's uh, sort, of, sort of like a symbol of Hiroshima city. And people use that for, you know, to move from one place to another. It's kind of like bus, uh, buses, but the bus street cars. Um, it is said uh, that um, a street car started running three days after atomic bombing. And it's, it's really, really incredible. But at the same time, um, it wasn't like, uh, you know, three days and everything was back. No, uh, one street car really badly damaged started running street in ashes uh, without anything. Um, people really pushed to get this one done because people really wanted to show that something is moving. Because after atomic bombing, nothing was moving, uh, people said, like really silence um, and no movement. Uh, so people really wanted to show that something is moving, people are alive and people are making efforts uh, to give hope. Uh, so that's what they did. Now, more mid and long term, uh, it, things become much, much more complicated. For example, land readjustment, housing, construction of roads, and also is um, creating park space, open space, and also providing medical support to atomic bomb victims. This uh, last point, providing medical support to atomic bomb victims, uh, Professor Hirose, uh, Hirose talked about uh, talked about it um, in Nagasaki. It's the same in Hiroshima. Uh, and also housing, it was really um, difficult uh, because after atomic bombing, many people lost their houses. So they had to um, create something. Uh, they had to improvise. So uh, many people started building in an illegal manner. So uh, uh, created uh, and end result was that there were uh, tremendous slum areas so in the middle and long term, um, local authorities needed to decide how to remove slum areas and secure safe housing for local people. So it was extremely challenging. 
Now, uh, also another important thing to remember uh, is that uh, during the time, um, 1945, after August, Hiroshima was not the only city that was damaged. Across Japan, uh, it is believed that over 100 cities were damaged by bombs. Uh, not atomic bomb. Atomic bomb uh, was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but other cities received lots of uh, conventional weapons, like bombs. So it was destroyed uh, significantly. However, impacts of atomic bombing uh, has uh, very unique aspects uh, because of massive destruction and also long-term impacts on human health. Um, Professor Hirose also uh, mentioned, um, you know, because exposure to uh, radiation creates possibility of cancer, leukemia, uh, and also um, many other things. And also possible and also psychological damage. Uh, many people were extremely, extremely worried that their uh, children, grandchildren may receive um, some sort of uh, impact from their exposure to atomic bombing. Um, so uh, um, damage caused by atomic bombing, uh, atomic bombing is very different from damage caused by regular conventional bombing. However, during that time, immediately after 1940, like around 1945, Hiroshima was not treated differently uh, it was just one of those 100 cities that needed reconstruction. And it was extremely, extremely difficult for Hiroshima. So what they did was that local, that the mayor of Hiroshima and local politicians uh, really worked hard, advocated for special treatment. And in 1945, uh, four years later, eventually this uh, Hiroshima Peace Memorial City construction law was enacted. And uh, because of this, uh, Hiroshima uh, was able to receive special support from the central government uh, and also uh, special procurement, uh, additional support. And also equally important, local people felt that uh, they are not abandoned. They, you know, morally, it was extremely important for them to, to see support from the capital, Tokyo. So that this law really pushed uh, Hiroshima's reconstruction and also accelerated recovery process. Um, and in 1955, uh, Peace Memorial Park and Museum were developed. Now, one important thing about this Hiroshima Peace Memorial City construction law is that uh, it clearly said Hiroshima will be transformed into a city of peace, a center of peace. So it's a transformation from a center of military operations to a center of peace. That was really transformative. And that gave vision, that gave goal for the people of Hiroshima. Um, so here, as it says, Hiroshima made a transition uh, to a center of peace. So this is how Hiroshima looks now. Uh, this is a view from my office. Uh, so you see atomic bomb dome and you see you are also looking at the Peace Memorial Park mm -hmm. and you see lots of greens. So now it's a, it's a modern resilient city. Now, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, uh, rebuilding, reconstruction of Hiroshima, uh, one of the main uh, successful elements was uh, economic growth. Um, and uh, these are some factors. Number one, um, after destruction of Hiroshima city, uh, many people actually came to Hiroshima to, to work. The reason is because Hiroshima, they uh, they put up, uh, they put out a, a plan, a strategy, saying that Hiroshima will uh, will increase economic activities by this much by when. Uh, so uh, people uh, people came to Hiroshima. 
for employment. Uh, people came to get job. So uh, people started flo uh, coming in and also capital investment uh, was, uh, became very, very active to, uh, to realize this economic growth uh, set, up, set out in action plan and also strategy. Also transformation of military facilities to private companies. So uh, Hiroshima used to be a, a center of military operations and there were many facilities and equipment. Now, um, through reconstruction, these military facilities and equipment were used for private companies. So, so that helped uh, private company activities. Um, and also special procurement for the Korean War. So Korean War happened around 1950, like the 50, 1953. Uh, now this war uh, created high demand in certain items such as canned food or, or automobiles. So uh, that also helped uh, the economy of Hiroshima. So there were these additional uh, elements, factors that supported um, the construction of Hiroshima and the invigoration of the, the economy of Hiroshima. Now, this is the final point, um, challenges. Uh, you know, of course, the, these are not the only challenges. There were so many, many challenges, but I would like to highlight one here. So um, government led the post-war re recovery process often faced opposition from local residents. Um, why? Uh, I think you probably, uh, many of you uh, will uh, quickly understand why this was the case because people's lives were so hard. Um, they really had to do everything they could to make, uh, to make the both ends meet. Every day, you know, how, like, uh, how to secure money, how to get money for food, how to pay for house and everything. And they were not receiving sufficient funding from the government. So it was extremely frustrating. Um, so uh, um, there, there were this, uh, you know, frustration and also a clash between local people and the government side. Um, so uh, of course, local authorities, government played an important role in post-conflict, uh, post-war reconstruction in Hiroshima. However, um, citizens, and also private sector uh, played an instrumental role in, um, in materializing um, this uh, um, recovery. So that's a very important point to remember. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. And I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So uh, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Miyoko Kumamoto of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITA. You have talked to us about world without nuclear weapons. Thank you for letting us know, um, know more about UNITA, its philosophy, and the thematic areas you are, you are covering. It's really appreciated. You have also shared with us the, hor the horror Hiroshima went through and the strategy for reconstructions. Here also, we must salute the great resilience of, uh, of Japanese, Japanese people, Japanese population. Uh, thanks to which Hiroshima has been turned from a center of military operation to a center of peace. And we can personally witness that because during our study tour, we felt peace everywhere we went in a bit in Hiroshima or, or Nagasaki. So congratulations for, for, for that. You also shared some, some challenges. I don't know if at that stage, Professor Yoshida would like to add some, um, some elements to share some of the observations as requested by, by the director. Uh, am I correctly sharing a picture? Yes, there's a picture we can see the trains or the buses. I don't 
Friendly. Yeah, it's a it's a tram that uh, uh, Madame Kumamoto mentioned on your right side. It's a picture of a tram that had been uh, badly damaged by a a bomb. On your left side, it is the same tram, the same exact tram that had been damaged uh, at the bomb time that is still running today in the city of Hiroshima. Uh, so that is really symbolic and keep reminding uh, citizens of Hiroshima and people all over Japan how uh, devastating the uh, A-bomb and the war itself was. And then the efforts that people at that time made to accelerate the uh, recovery from the devastation. And I hear that there are uh, uh, two or three uh, A-bomb uh, trams that are currently running in Hiroshima. Um, so it is just one another anecdote that uh, we Hiroshima city uh, host uh, the National League of Baseball team. Uh, but it was so poor and the uh, Hiroshima uh, Cup is the name of the team, did not have any private big sponsor, unlike all the other uh, professional baseball team. So what they did uh, was to uh, collect the donation from the citizens of Hiroshima. Uh, what you see uh, in this picture is that we, the, the, the baseball player uh, put a, a sake barrel and then people from the city donated whatever the small amount of money they could uh, offer. And that's how the uh, city of Hiroshima uh, had hope and uh, uh, expectation that we could do it. And that kind of spirit really helped uh, fasten the speed of recovery from the A-bomb. So I think it is a passion, great sense of passion uh, that the uh, people in Hiroshima uh, had. And I think this spirit is still living until today. Just I wanted to share these two photos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yoshida, for those informative, uh, very informative contributions. We really appreciate. Thank you very much. Now we're going to the session, uh, question and answer sessions. I see that some questions have already been answered, but still. I can give the floor to the chat moderator so that he will convey the questions to the panelists. So over to you, Bernard. Or Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Salyu. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But if, if we can hear you louder, that would be good. All right. So I will try to increase my, the volume of my voice. And the, as, you, as you highlighted, some of the questions have been answered. I will probably start with the questions that have not been answered, and probably we move to those which, later on, to those which have been answered in the chat room. Bernard, hello. can you yes. be closer to your microphone so that we can hear you better? Sorry. All right. OK, thank uh, you. How about now? Yeah, it's better. Can you hear? OK. Yes, we can. So, it's better. Go ahead, please. Yes, I, I'm saying that, uh, uh, as you highlighted, some of the questions have been answered in the chat room. I probably start with the questions which have not been answered, and then we move to those which have been answered uh, later on to see if uh, uh, the speakers can add something. So I start with the questions, uh, the first question, which is the, based on your experience on Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombing, uh, what can you advise the United States, I suppose this is the United States of America, uh, on withdrawal of Iran accord about uh, nuclear weapons? And this is a question which was asked by Dr. Wycliffe Ongeta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wycliffe, for the question. And the question was addressed to Professor Satoshi Hiroshi. Yes, uh, very frankly, I do not see any persuasive or logical reason which supports the 
President Trump's decision to withdraw from Iran deal? Well, most likely President Trump wanted to express his strength by putting more emphasis on military capability and try to threaten Iran to make compromise. But frankly, President Trump is totally wrong. And I strongly expect the next president, most likely President Biden, will review and reveal the decision and the United States will resume a negotiation with Iran. Well, there are many speculations and suspicions around the activities of Iran. And there are, I know, there are some strong opinions or hawkish activists, even in Iran. But in overall, even it's a fragile, the deal with Iran is quite important. So strongly, for the moment, I expect the United States to change the decision to withdraw from the deal. That is my opinion. Thank you, uh, Professor Hiros. Maybe we can give also the uh, floor to uh, Dr. Miyuko uh, so that you can uh, add your opinion as well. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I do not really have anything uh, else to add, uh, and I highly echo what Professor Hiros has said. It'll be uh, extremely important for all nations to have dialogue and explore possible ways to move forward. Uh, so a withdrawal would not be a way, but um, coming together and have dialogue would be a good approach. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Miko Kumamoto. And we move to the next question. And I think Professor uh, Satoshi Hiros may have answered this question. So the question is, when you look at China, USA, and a few countries in the position of nuclear weapons, you can see that their citizens enjoy some relative peace. And when you construct these with African countries, for example, South Sudan, we are worried about AK-47 and disarmament. And you can see that citizens enjoy limited peace. Is it essential to think about other disarmament in Africa? And this is a question by Tito. Thank you, Tito. And the question was addressed to Professor Santoshi uh, Hiros. Over to you. Yes, yes, yes. That is also a serious problem, I know. And actually, small arms and weapons like AK rifles have killed much more people than atomic bombs killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And AK rifles are killing people. Even in this moment, I know that is a very, very serious problem. And actually, our ultimate goal is to achieve complete and general disarmament, regardless of the types of arms and weapons. All military forces and military expenditures should be abolished. I know I'm talking too idealistic or too op optimistic, but still I believe we do not have to give up. And the reason why we are tackling the problem of nuclear weapon is that nuclear weapons once they would be used, they can terminate human beings. 
within minutes. And that is a fatal threat to all human beings. This year, we had a series of web-based dialogue concerning nuclear weapons and COVID-19. And we have a couple of very famous professors specialized in communicable diseases and viruses. And they agreed COVID-19 is not fatal for the very existence and very survival of human beings. COVID-19 is killing. COVID-19 might kill millions, but they agree nuclear weapons would kill billions and wipe out all living things from the surface of the earth. And they say, it's clear which is more dangerous, nuclear weapons or COVID-19. Even they agree, medical professors, they say, of course, nuclear weapons are more dangerous. If I could, uh, yes. Sorry, so please I, go ahead. <laughs> personally, I have small reservation because when I was working with the United Nations, I have a couple of experiences that someone posed guns against me when I was on duty. I know a feeling when one is scared by gun how people think. And I realized that if I would be killed by nuclear weapons or I would be killed by AK rifles, there is no difference. Absolutely, there is no difference. For victims, the types of arms and weapons used in killing of themselves, killing of them will not make any difference. So, I am against any arms and weapons to be used against human beings. But I'm not almighty. I cannot hunt everything by myself. So considering my expertise, I'm now concentrating on nuclear disarmament. That is the only reason I'm talking about nuclear weapons. Uh, if I may on. come in, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Hirose. Uh, I would like to, uh, so uh, this is uh, from uh, UN's perspective. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So uh, the UN has issued this uh, agenda called Disarmament Agenda. It was issued by the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres. And in this disarmament agenda, we are talking about three types of weapons. Number one is conventional weapons. And you know this includes AK-47, uh, the one that you mentioned, and also landmines, conventional weapons that are actually killing so many people right now. Uh, the second type is uh, weapons of mass, uh, dis uh, mass destruction, and here nuclear weapons are included. And this is also extremely important because uh, we need to uh, promote this armament of uh, weapons of mass dis destruction to save humanity. And the third type of weapon is uh, future weapons. So here uh, we are talking about uh, autonomous weapon or using AI or frontier technologies. It's a, it's a future world, uh, but there are so many things already happening. So uh, uh, disarmament of these three types of weapon is considered extremely important. Thank you, let me, let me stop here. Thank you, back to you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yuko Komamoto and uh, with, Professor Satoshi, uh, you have been emphasizing the dialogue, which is very important, addressing issues via dialogue rather than uh, taking weapons and fighting. And uh, uh, referring to one example of recent conflict uh, in the, in the uh, between Azerbaijan and the uh, Armenia, there have been dialogue for over 30 years without addressing the problem which was there. And recently, then the two countries decided to fight. And it's only after fighting that they decided to 
to, uh, to go to dialogue again. So why are humans or even let's say government do not address issues without fighting? And, and also, what is the strategy that need to be introduced in dialogue to bring people, governments, uh, to come to agreement without having to fight? Can any, any of you answer the question? It's a very difficult question, yes. Well, one thing is I can say is that, uh, okay. First of all, ordinary people, normally they don't want to kill others or to be killed by others. In short, ordinary people, they do not want to give up their ordinary life and go to war. However, as a group, Oftentimes, people be faith in different way. That is the very reason why even individuals, they do not want to go to war, but the government would decide to go to war. There is a, there are several very serious and detailed research on why Japan started a war against the United States and the United Kingdom. And it's clear even the emperor, the prime minister and superior officers of the army and the Navy, personally, all of them were against the war because practically there was very little hope that Japan would win against the United States and the United Kingdom, of course. But any of them could not say no. Personally, all of them believed that Japan would lose and the result would be devastating for Japan. But still, all of them say there was no choice. And still many political scientists in Japan, maybe not only in Japan, are working on why this stupid decision was agreed in spite of personal opposition among high-ranking government officials, politicians, even military leaders in Japan. And I do not have the exact answer, but we have to examine such cases so that the personal desire to live in peace must be realized through The exchanges within the group, I mean within the nation. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Satoshi. Uh, Dr. Miko Kumamoto, uh, do you have any, uh, any, any, anything you can add on that, especially focusing on how the kind of strategy we can use to bring people and nations to agreement before they go to war? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I fully agree with Professor Hirose. This is a very, very difficult question. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, I think there is a general understanding that prevention is the best uh, policy, best strategy. Once a conflict violence happens, uh, and all the damages are caused, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll take 
uh, so much time and so much effort to recover, or it may not be even possible to fully recover. So prevention is the best policy. Um, but everyone knows that it has been very, very difficult. It has been extremely hard. Um, Many things Professor Hiroshi already mentioned, so I do not want to uh, I do not want to repeat the same thing. But one thing to add is that uh, one of the things that um, the UN is really pushing is to make peace processes, uh, peace negotiations, more inclusive, meaning uh, invite representatives from diverse groups. Uh, to join the table for peace negotiations. Like for example, uh, one uh, aspect is gender aspect. Um, it'll, be, uh, it'll be important to have more female representation in the peace negotiation delega uh, delegation team, uh, or also youth representation. And also uh, if a country has consists of various tribal groups to have re representation from these tribal groups power sharing um, and we we know very well that power sharing is often um, get stuck um, but uh, yeah. even even so to promote inclusiveness in peace negotiation um, for prevention and also peacekeeping is a, is crucial thank you Thank you so much. And I think you highlighted really key messages there when you say about power sharing. And I think probably that's very important uh, when people in different countries, even though they have different groups, but they make sure each group is included in everyday life of the country, including the leadership. Maybe that can be a solution. Maybe if I move on to other questions, I want to switch to my colleague, Jose to see if there are some questions that were uh, asked in French. Jose? Thank you, Bennett, to give the floor to me. Uh, but um, in the chat, no, no question is in, is in French. All the, all the questions are, are in English. <clears throat> but uh, I have the impression that you have not covered one question which is not answered yet. No. So maybe I can just uh, ask that question. Before yeah, giving the, floor. yeah, the question is to is addressed to Professor Satoshi, and they said that the, the unique potential is about the unique potential of universities and education sector in promoting peace intentions and true dialogue. So the professor said that uh, the North Korean and so the, the North and South Korean uh, delegates were willing to speak about disarmament because the conference was organized by universities and not, gov and not governments. So, so this seems to suggest a powerful and unique role of education that cannot be achieved through government. So the, we wanted the professor to, to elaborate more, a bit more on what makes education different in this sense. Is, does he think that the education is more, more effective proven tool that official states uh, and uh, for, for, for official state and UN dialogue. So this is the, this is the question I, I, I want for so maybe uh, for so Satoshi to answer first. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes, may I? Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Actually, you may know that Japan and North Korea do not have any official diplomatic relations and we cannot exchange diplomats or national envoys. And North Korea is such a special state. And unless there is a special permission, citizens of North Korea cannot visit other states. And we have to make some special arrangements by using name of sometimes the, our university, but actually it is quite difficult to contact someone from North Korea. Even we say we are representing our university and we would like to have some academic exchange. So we ask several 
organizations like the Pagwash Conference, which is very famous in international field for promoting peace from the viewpoint of science, or a couple of non-governmental organizations of Russia and Mongolia. Russia and Mongolia are friends of North Korea. And if we, are, we, we use the names of organizations based in Russia or Mongolia, North Koreans would accept. Not always, but there is a possibility. And that was the reason why we had a workshop in Moscow, not in Nagasaki. We asked Russian, couple of Russian organizations, and we succeeded in to get the support from even Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they persuaded North Koreans to attend the workshop organized by our university with the cooperation of couple of Russian universities and Russian organizations active in supporting North Korea. And that kind of flexibility is the merit of dialogue conducted by universities, academic institutions, and non-governmental organizations. And actually we had diplomats from Japan, diplomats from North Korea, diplomats from South Korea, and former diplomats from United States, and of course, diplomats from Russia. It is impossible to organize such meeting on governmental basis. But we asked all of them to attend the conference, not as a representative or delegates from the government, but as an academics of private capacity. That was the reason why we succeeded in have a dialogue with North Korea. And frankly, I think it's, pos it's possible even by the United Nations. Uh, uh, actually, I cannot disclose the details, but last year we had a similar program organized by United Nations. United Nations, certain agency of United Nations organized a study tour to Nagasaki to study about the recovery from devastation. And that study team was organized by participants from states suffering from civil war. And there were representatives from conflicting parties among the group. And the purpose of the UN agency was to organize a frank discussion among members of warring parties in somewhere distant from the battlefield. I was invited to deliver a lecture like this, but it was just a, a kind of, what you say? I do not say it's a dummy, but it was not really an important part. The important what, part was the discussion among the participants. Once they were separated from the parties, they had a very frank discussion. And even a couple of them made a joke that if they had such kind of dialogue in their own nation, they might be assassinated. It was only possible in foreign state, far from their state. And I think sometimes the UN agencies are conducting similar tactics just to remove their former titles and let the people to talk on 
personal capacity. May facilitate the negotiation, I think. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor Satoshi. I wanted to know if Dr. Miyoko could elaborate a bit more about, about this potential of education to promote peace compared to official states and the UN. Um, thank you so much. I don't have many things to add, uh, but you know, uh, from a UNITERS perspective, uh, we are uh, collaborating closely with various organizations, including academic institutions uh, for various types of uh, training. Um, so um, uh, for any you know, concrete uh, opportunities uh, you'll be interested in, um, I'll be more than happy to have a dialogue and discuss. So uh, please let me know. Thank you. So Jose, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Ben, I think it's, a, yeah, all right. it's okay. Thank yeah, thank you, yeah. uh, Dr. Mihiko Komomato. And for the answer are the Professor Satoshi. And we have a new question which has not been answered in the discussion forum. Uh, that, that's the question asked by Dr. Yubiko Yokozeki, uh, the director of Ikiba. And some people ask Dr. Yumiko Yokozeki why Japanese government does not join the UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, could Professor Hiroshi uh, or uh, Kumamoto answer that question? The very reason why Japanese government is against the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons is the opposition of the United States. You know, as a nuclear weapon state, together with other nuclear weapon states, the United States is opposing treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. And even United States is putting pressure to its allies, including Japan. But even without such a pressure, Japanese government is heavily relying on the US-Japan Security Treaty and the so-called nuclear umbrella provided by the United States. And United States, uh, Japanese government is insisting that treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons is contradicting the fundamental security policy of Japan. That is the military alliance with the United States and nuclear umbrella provided by the United States. And though Japanese government is advocating nuclear disarmament, they say treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons is not the correct path to nuclear disarmament because it's totally unrealistic, they say. That is the reason why Japan is not supporting TPN there. All right, thank you, Professor Santoshi. So, Jose, can you see any other questions in the chat room? Mm, no, no more questions. Okay, so there's one question which was answered by Professor Santoshi, which was, uh, you presented the statistics of countries possessing nuclear weapons. Yes. Is this statistic different from the one you presented last year? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, we are updating the statistics every year. Normally, we publish the new statistics every June or July. And United States and Russia are reducing their nuclear warheads about 200 each annually, but the pace of reducing the nuclear warheads 
are somewhat slowed down for last several years, comparing to 10 or 15 years ago, they're reducing or disposing about four to 500 nuclear, four nuclear warheads each. But now they're disposing around 200 only nuclear warheads each. And we are not so sure if they will continue to reduce the nuclear foreheads. But if Mr. Biden will become next president, well, well, there is a good chance that the United States would continue to reduce and would try to persuade Russia to follow the United States. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Satoshi Hiros and uh, Miko Kumamoto. And thank you, Jose, for helping me to look at those questions and address them to the appropriate speaker. Uh, for the sake of keeping with time, uh, over to, back to you, Saliu, for continuing moderating this session. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you, Jose, for having remarkably uh, moderated that uh, chat session. So we are now coming to the end of the session. And at this point, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Yumiko Yokozeki, but I would like to know if Professor Yoshida has something to add at this stage, Professor? No, thank you very much, Salyu. Everything is fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. So thank you very much, dear participant. Thank you, our, our honorable panelists, uh, Professor Satoshi Hiroshi from Nagasaki University and Director Mieko Kumamoto, Director of uh, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research Unitar. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Yumiko Yokozeki, Director of IGBA for the closing remarks. So Yumiko, over to you. Thank you very much, Saliu. I see just the one last question to uh, Professor um, Satoshi, but I think a uh, professor can look at look at it and maybe respond uh, personally. It is about the uh, issue of the um, history of uh, the war uh, war in the Pacific. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Hirose, my old friend, and uh, uh, Mrs. Kumamoto. Also, I have known for quite some time, and of course, uh, Professor um, uh, Yoshida. This was a very informative um, session where we learned a lot about Nagasaki and the Hiroshima, its history and atomic bombs. Now, um, this show, showed us why peace research and peace education are so prominent in both Nagasaki and the Hiroshima universities. And uh, also a um, strong message from um, um, Professor Hirose, nuclear weapons are not necessarily evil, but they are absolute evil and must be eradicated. And then also I would like to commend uh, Mrs. Kumamoto and the UNITAR's um, continuous effort to share the experience and important message from uh, Hiroshima. When we visited your uh, office, we realized that you have a, a very um, clear view of the um, atomic, what you call atomic monument. That is wonderful. That reminds all of us every day that the war should not be repeated. Unfortunately, as I am talking about it, that we have a number of uh, military conflicts in the different countries. Um, Ethiopia now, Mali, DRC, and uh, and now um, out of this our continent, but in Iran, a lot of um, very difficult uh, situations. So, where do we do the demilitarization? Where do we uh, plant the seed of peace? And I would like to go back to the preamble of the Constitution of UNESCO. Since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women 
the defenses of peace must be constructed. So we have to be a good builders for peace and resilience among the minds of the young people in Africa so that uh, we will be building a strong peace loving population and uh, economically pro act active and governance um, people who young people who love governance and peace so for that our efforts are very much uh, needed so thank you very much again i and i personally enjoyed the session very much and i look forward to the next session which is the last session um, there are over 100 people registered for this but unfortunately because of the um connectivity and so on uh, not all of them were able to uh, come, but uh, we will make sure that the recording is available for those people who couldn't come and join. So thank you very much again for your participation and thank you very much for excellent lecture and discussion. Thank you. Back to you, Salyu. Thank you very much, Shimiko, for those lovely words of conclusion. Let us all be builders and ambassadors of peace and resilience. So I don't know if uh, Professor Satoshi and uh, Director Miyoko would like to share their, their email so that questions can be addressed to them later. Anyway, they have answered almost all the questions and uh, we are very grateful to, to them. Thank you very much for uh, giving that, that opportunity to learn from your experience and thank you all participants. Thank you very much and see you later. Nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. And Thank you very much. Healthy life. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.